Okay. Thank you everyone for joining us today for our ASAD Pennsylvania East chapter speaker series. I'm Kimberly Slater. I'm the communications director for the chapter. Uh, this is a virtual presentation. So we just ask uh, if you'd like, you can easily pin the gallery view on your Zoom screen uh, to see the speakers and the presentation. And we just ask that you mute yourself. Um, it's always best to turn your camera off during the presentation if you like as well, um, or you can stay on. Today is the NCIDQ fall exam info session with CIDQ's Director of Engagement, Kimberly Woods, and our Professional Development Director, Julia Abriola, who is ASA, uh, Allied ASAD Associate IIDA, and she's actually studying for her NCIQ exam to take it in the fall. So ASID is the oldest, largest, and only interior design organization where its members encompass all aspects of interior design. So we focus on everything from commercial, healthcare, residential, education, hospitality, retail, multifamily, everything and all. So we'd like to thank our chapter sponsors today who, with their support, these events are possible. So we have our platinum sponsors, Fisher and Paikel and Gerhards, our gold sponsors, Benjamin Moore, Fesson Hall and Bright Light Design Center, and our silver sponsors, Dow Tile and Kravit. Again, this presentation is being recorded. So if you miss something, we'll have it up on our YouTube page in a few uh, days, and you'll be able to watch that again. Again, since it's a virtual presentation, we just ask you to please pin uh, your gallery view. That's a su suggestion. So you can see the speakers and the presentation. And we just ask that you mute yourself during the presentation. Some upcoming events. Uh, tomorrow for the chapter, we have our product prop up. They're quick 10 minute virtual presentations before our chapter board meetings with chapter sponsors. Upcoming in September, we have our chapter's annual meeting and celebration. And we also have upcoming as part of Design Philadelphia, we have the kickoff to in the Interior Design Awards in October. So again, I'm gonna now kick this off to Julia for our fall exam info session. And I'll be back at the end. Joining today. Um, as Kim said, I'm the professional development director of the PA East chapter for ASID. And I'm very excited to have Kimberly Woods, the director of engagement for CIDQ here. Um, she's a super breadth of knowledge. She always does a great job with these <laughs> presentations. I went to one last year and it was super helpful. Um, so she'll run through a quick presentation. Um, I know we have some questions that I'm sure she'll answer. And if there are any additional questions, we can do so at the end. So Kimberly, why don't you go ahead? Great, thanks, Julia. I'll go ahead and get my screen share set up and then we'll get started here. Appreciate you all again joining myself and the Pennsylvania East chapter of ASID to learn a little bit more about the NCIDQ exam this evening. Uh, my name again is Kimberly Woods and I am the Director of Engagement for CIDQ and we are the organization that administers the NCIDQ exam. As Julia mentioned, Really appreciate those of you who submitted some questions ahead of time. I have those copied over to a Word document, so I'll be keeping an eye on those. We will cover a lot of the topics in the presentation, but definitely encourage any other questions you think of throughout or afterwards. You can take advantage of that chat box and we'll be keeping an eye on that during and after the presentation as well. In addition to this presentation being recorded, I will also share this slide deck with the ASID Pennsylvania East chapter as well. So you can certainly reference back to it later on or reach out to me directly using the contact info on the screen with any questions that you think of after the fact. But with that, we'll go ahead and get into it here and share a few reasons as to why NCIDQ certification is important. 
The first one, the fact that it is the industry standard. So our exam is the exam that is specifically used to test an individual on their ability to competently practice interior design. Beyond that, it's also a great way to uh, differentiate yourself from the competition, especially if you end up practicing in an unregulated jurisdiction. For example, Pennsylvania currently has no interior design regulation in place. So becoming NCIDQ certified is an easy way for you to demonstrate that you have the education, you have the work experience, you understand how to apply building codes, and you understand how to protect the public's health, safety, and welfare. It's also a great way for you to set yourself apart from your peers or from the competition, especially when you are seeking different job opportunities. It lets that employer know that you have taken the initiative and that you have dedicated to growing yourself as a professional. As it mentions, it is recognized by nearly every regulated jurisdiction in North America, the exception to that being the state of California. They are the only state that has a state-specific exam that tests specifically on California building codes. Otherwise, if you're looking to become licensed, registered, or certified in interior design anywhere else in the U.S. or Canada, you would need to have passed our exam in order to do so. And you can also see I've included some independent quotes from our two professional organizations, ASID and IIDA, about a potential increase in your salary that you may see as a result of becoming NCIDQ certified. Definitely something we have heard time and time again of individuals getting a bump in their salary or a bonus as a result of passing the exam. So a potential benefit you might see on the back end as well. In terms of what we're going to cover tonight, all the topics you see on the screen here, again, a good overview of the exam. If you're interested in learning more at any time, you can always head over to our website at CIDQ.org. It is always the most accurate and up-to-date source of information about the exam. So to share a few recent announcements, perhaps you've heard about these or seen them posted on our website, but the first item there is our candidate handbook. This was posted earlier this year and is a great resource for those of you who are considering becoming NCIDQ certified, or maybe you've just gotten started on the process. That handbook is going to walk through Everything you're going to need to know from start till finish to becoming NCIDQ certified. So everything from becoming eligible for the exams, applying for the exams, where you take them, when you take them, how much they cost, how the exams are scored, how you maintain your certification, everything we're going to talk about tonight, but in much more detail is covered in that handbook. So that is a great reference point for you all. Again, it's available on our website. It's an interactive PDF handbook that anybody is able to download. So definitely encourage you to take a look at that if you have not already. The other big announcement was the introduction of remote proctoring for our two multiple choice exam sections, the IDFX and the IDPX exams. So whenever you go take an exam, one option is to physically travel to any Prometric test center around the world, or for our two multiple choice exam sections, the IDFX and IDPX, those can now be taken at your home or office computer via remote proctoring. So that will make the exam a lot more accessible in terms of you not having to physically travel to a test center, uh, you'll be able to test in an environment that you are comfortable and familiar with. And it also opens up the actual appointment options as you can test day or night. That being said, there are a number of parameters that you would need to meet prior to selecting that remote proctoring option. For example, you would need to have a clean desk area, no notebook, 
phone, water bottle, anything at all. You would need to have a quiet, uh, distraction-free walled room with a door. You need to have specific internet speed and a webcam that would be turned on for the duration of the appointment, as well as a few other items. That is all detailed in that candidate handbook, as well as in a frequently asked questions document on the scheduling page of our website. So I know a couple of you mentioned that uh, you're interested in testing this fall and the questions you submitted ahead of time. So I encourage you to take a look at that option really make sure that you look through that document to make sure that you have the appropriate system and environment requirements that are necessary to, again, test at your home or office. So in terms of the basics of the exam, you've already heard me mention two of the sections, but it is a three-part exam made up of three separate exams, the IDFX, IDPX, and the practicum. And you do need to take and pass all three in order to become NCIDQ certified. This first exam section, the IDFX, tests specifically on book knowledge or what you would have learned during your college education. And you are eligible to take that first exam as early as the final year of your bachelor's or master's degree program in interior design or any time after you graduate. You don't need to have any work experience for that first exam section. So I know that one of you mentioned uh, that you're graduating from Drexel University soon. So this would be the first exam that you would be able to get started on. And if possible, we do encourage you to take that first section sooner rather than later or closer to graduating if you're able to do so just because that information might be a little bit fresher on your mind and perhaps a little bit easier for you to recall. Again, it's another way for you to differentiate yourself as you are entering the job market. And as a student or recent graduate, you're kind of already in that studying test taking mode, uh, which it can be difficult to get back into once you've uh, entered the working world. The other two exam sections, the IDPX and the practicum, require a minimum of two years of work experience, and those two sections are testing on what you have learned through professional practice in the working world. So those of you on the call that have been out there working for two, three, four, et cetera, years, then you would be eligible for all three exams once you have both that education and work experience complete. You can see that the first two sections are pretty straightforward in their format. They are all multiple choice questions on the IDFX and the IDPX. The practicum, on the other hand, does have some different question types on it. And we do have a demo video on our website that we encourage you to take a look at prior to taking that third exam section. You can also see on this slide that I have posted the passing rates from the spring exam that occurred in April of this year. We also do post this information on our website, so you can certainly take a look at it there anytime as well. It is really important to know that in order to be successful in passing the exam, you do need to put in the time and effort to prepare for the exam. It's not something you can just Lean on your experience, lean on your education. Again, it's going to take some effort in studying to prepare for the exam in order to be successful in passing it. And I know there were a number of questions submitted about uh, best tips for studying. How do I get ready? How much time should I spend? Where do I get study materials uh, that were submitted ahead of time? So we'll address those questions here in a few minutes. Focusing in on our practicum exam section, again, this is that third exam, has those different question types, it's offered on a different exam platform. As I mentioned a minute ago, we have this demo video, which can be accessed on the practicum page of our website, as well as our YouTube channel. And we definitely encourage you to take a look at that video to get a demonstration of each of those question types you will see on this exam section. 
And watching that video will also give you a better understanding as to how the information is displayed on the computer screen and ultimately how you will navigate through the exam platform come test day. As it mentions, this exam section has no drawing involved and you don't need to have any specific software knowledge. So uh, no CAD, Revit, SketchUp, Rhino, Adobe programs, anything like that. Essentially, if you are able to use a mouse and navigate on the computer screen, you can be successful in navigating the exam platform. As it also mentions, the practicum is split into three case studies, a small commercial, large commercial, and residential. And you do take all three case studies as part of this exam section. For all three exams, time management is really critical, but particularly for the practicum, I always recommend going in with a game plan. So perhaps you knew that large commercial was a weaker area for you. You could go in planning to spend two hours on large commercial, one hour on small commercial, and one hour on residential. Maybe when you got in the appointment, not quite how things would go, but you don't want to be three and a half hours in and still working on that first case study. So again, for all three exams, make sure that you're keeping your eye on the clock and that you are managing that time wisely. When it comes to qualifying for the exam, we do require a combination of education and work experience. This is a copy of our eligibility chart from our website, you would just determine which of these boxes your education falls into, and then follow the arrow down to determine the corresponding number of work experience hours that are needed, again with the minimum being about two years of full-time work. If any of you listening on the call have a non-traditional uh, pathway to where you are today, we do also have an alternative review program. You can read more about that on the paths page of our website. There is a separate fee and separate application process for that. Uh, and we try to steer people towards that as a last resort, but it does exist again if you do not meet one of these traditional pathways. The other important thing to point out right here in the middle of the screen is that anyone can count up to 1,760 hours worked prior to graduating towards the overall work experience hours that are needed to qualify for the exam. So if any of you have done any internships or co-ops or just regular full-time or part-time work while you were enrolled in school, you would be able to count those hours as long as they're in interior design up to the 1,760 mark, uh, again, towards the overall hours needed to qualify for the exam. All of those hours would be documented on the same work verification form that you would use for any uh, post-graduation full-time employment that you would receive. When it comes to applying for the exams, there are essentially two options separated here by this gray bar. If any of you are thinking of applying in the near future, I encourage you to go to our apply page and check out the video we have posted. It walks through this process in much greater detail and also includes some screenshots of what you would actually see or experience when filling out the online application. But in terms of the two options here, the top one would be for those of you who are currently in the final year of your bachelor's or master's degree program in interior design, or you've already graduated but you don't quite have your work experience hours yet. In that case, again, you can go ahead and get started on the exams by applying for that first section, the IDFX, again, that fundamentals exam that's testing on what you learned while you were in school. And for that, you just need your school transcript and pay the application fee. So pretty quick process. Then when you are ready, and you have your work experience complete, you would come back and submit the second portion of the application for the IDPX and practicum exams. 
Again, the two sections that are testing on that work experience. And for that, you would need your school transcript. You would upload your completed work forms to your online account and pay the application fee. Alternatively, you could wait until you have both your school and work complete. Go ahead and apply for all three exams at one time using the same application materials. So again, if you do have your schooling already complete, you do meet our minimum work experience hours. We do recommend applying for all three exams at one time, just so everything is linked under one application. One of the common uh, misconceptions we hear is that people think if they apply for all three exams and they get approved, they are required to take all three exams at one time, and that is not true. Applying for all three exams and getting approved just means you are eligible to take all three exams. It's then up to you how you want to take those exams within your application period, which I'll touch on now. So looking at the breakdown of the fees, also one of the questions that was submitted ahead of time, which was what are the costs of the exam? So this slide has the breakdown in alignment with the previous slide with those two different application options. Generally speaking, this application fee is a one-time fee. So to apply for the IDFX only, this $95 fee is valid for four exam administrations, which is about two years. So you would have four opportunities once you've been approved to take and pass the IDFX exam. Then when you are ready and you have that work experience complete, you'll submit that second portion of the application for the IDPX and practicum at a cost of $145. And that fee would be valid for 10 exam administrations, which is about five years. Or again, alternatively, you can wait and apply for all three exams at one time, which means you have both your school and work complete. And this $225 fee would then be valid for 10 exam administrations, which is about five years. So once your application is approved, your timeline to test will begin. In this bottom of example, when you have applied for all three exams and been approved for all three, again, you will have 10 exam administrations, 10 opportunities to take and pass all three sections, and it's up to you how you want to split those exams up within that 10 window period. Once you have applied for the exams and been approved and you are ready to start testing, that is when you pay this exam fee. That is the fee that you pay to actually book your exam appointment. And you want to wait to pay that fee until you're feeling confident, ready to test, schedule's looking good. Because if for some reason you're not successful in passing the exam or you need to cancel or you don't show up, you would need to repay this full exam fee again in the future in order to retake the exam. So you can see that it can add up very quickly all in to apply for the exams and take each one one time. It is over a thousand dollars. So it's definitely an investment in your future. I strongly recommend talking with your employer or your supervisor to see how they can be both financially and non-financially supportive of your efforts to pursue NCIDQ certification. It is very, very common to hear of employers covering the cost of the exams. Oftentimes it's in the form of a reimbursement. So you would typically need to pay the exam fee upfront out of pocket. And once you pass the exam, they'll reimburse you on the back end. We've also heard of companies providing time off to take the exams, uh, providing time off to study for the exams, as well as providing a budget to purchase study materials. So if this is on your radar, I encourage you again to talk with your employer or supervisor to see how they can be supportive. Many companies have line items in their budget for professional development. Those funds often don't get used and can be 
uh, attributed to covering the cost of the exam. If for some reason your company is not able to financially assist with the exam costs, there may be other ways they can assist. So again, if it is something they are aware of that you are studying for, maybe they can match you up with a mentor in the office. Maybe they're aware of a local study group that's happening. Uh, they have resources that they've used or that past employees have used that they're able to share with you. So there are other ways they can be supportive of you as well. Moving on to the dates and deadlines here, spend a little extra time on this just because we are in a critical time period. I'm gonna focus on this fall exams block, but as you can see, the exam is offered two times each year in April and the spring and in October in the fall. If any of you listening to this are interested in applying for the fall exam and you have not yet done so, you have about two, three weeks left <laughs> to get your application submitted. The deadline is July 31st. That is a hard deadline. Anything submitted after that will be pushed for review for spring of 23. So again, you have a few more weeks to get your application submitted if you have not done so to be eligible for review for the fall exam. If some of you have already been approved to test, you can log into your account and purchase an exam now until the end of September for a date in October. As I alluded to a minute ago, when you pay that exam fee, so if you would pay that exam fee now, it is only valid for a date in October. So if you do not want to test in October, you should not purchase the exam because it is only valid for a date in October. Uh, all of that information is, of course, posted on our website and in that Canada handbook, but just want to make sure that you guys are clear on that. And again, there are cancellation fees and rescheduling fees as well. So um, if you make that decision, try to make sure that you really are uh, committed or firm on it, just so you're not losing out on any of that money, but you do have until the end of September to make that decision as well. As I mentioned earlier, exams can be taken at any Prometric test center around the world. And again, the IDFX and IDPX exams can be taken at your home or office via that remote proctoring option. The other really important thing to know is the exam is the exact same no matter where you take it. So if you happen to take the first section in Pennsylvania, and then you move to Arizona and take the second section there. And then you move to Singapore and take the third section there. Again, it's the same exam because it is not jurisdiction specific and it will continue to travel with you as you move throughout your career. So this was definitely the most popular question on the uh, question submitted ahead of time. Again, uh, tips for studying, how much time should I spend? Where do I get study materials? What books do we recommend? Uh, how do I prepare? Lots of questions about studying. So I can't give too much information, but hopefully you'll, you'll still find it useful what I have to share. Uh, as an organization, CIDQ does not recommend or endorse any specific study books, courses, online workshops, flashcards, uh, anything that's out there that is all produced by independent third parties that are not associated with us. And so it's really up to you to do your own due diligence and determine what might work for you. We often recommend checking with friends, coworkers, uh, fellow chapter members, teachers, people you know that have recently taken the exam to learn what they use so you can make the best decision for yourself. In terms of some of those specific questions, uh, we did a survey a couple of years ago and the results stated that uh, more than 80% of test takers spend a minimum of two to three months preparing for the exam. I've also heard upwards of a year. Uh, within that, though, even that level varies in terms of the time commitment. I know some people are studying three hours every single night for three months, and I know some people that are studying three hours total a week for three months leading up to the exam. So it's really important to determine what works best for you. 
Uh, hopefully you know how you learn best, whether that's listening to videos, reading books, uh, studying with a friend, writing things down, creating flashcards, uh, putting sticky notes all over your house or office and pointing things out as you're walking by them, sitting in on meetings at your company. Um, again, you'll have to sort of do your own self-assessment and determine what's going to work best for you, but hopefully that uh, time frame provided a little bit of insight. I'll also share another tip here in a second, but in terms of what we have on our website, we do have a listing of the ASID and IIDA study groups that we are made aware of. We also have a list of books that are used to write the exam questions. So you might uh, see some of your old textbooks on there or some books throughout your company or even local library that you might want to reference in your studying as well. We also have on our website these test your knowledge practice questions for the IDFX and IDPX exams. Again, those two multiple choice uh, exam sections. These are a free resource. Anybody can go check them out today if you'd like to do so. There's just 10 sample questions for each one, but again, they are provided as a resource for you to get a better understanding of the types of questions you can expect to see on those first two exam sections. The most important thing for those of you who are studying now and in the future, make sure that you come back to our website to download the exam blueprints, which are the content outlines, and the practicum exam resources as these items align with what we are testing on the live exam. So one of the question was about uh, getting the best content to study. At a minimum, you need to be referencing these blueprints. So as it mentions again, these are the content outlines, it details those content areas that you need to be familiar with for each of the exam sections. If you take a look at the blueprints, you will also see a breakdown of the percentage of questions that are allocated to each content area as well as some descriptions of what you're expected to know or demonstrate for each content area. For the practicum exam, we have these case study standards. So that document has some additional details about what each of those three case studies on the practicum exam will cover. And most importantly, we have this exam codes document. Currently on our website, we have the document for the spring exam. It will be updated later this summer with a new document for the fall exam. So make sure that you're keeping an eye on the website, keeping an eye on your email. If you are approved for the practicum, you'll get that email. Use a personal email if you don't already for your account so you can make sure you get all of those important updates. But specifically for these exam codes, you can certainly take a look at it today. If you are testing this fall, they're not going to change that dramatically but you will see the specific chapters and sections from the 2018 IBC or International Building Code that you need to be familiar with for the practicum exam specifically. On the exam, you're being asked to demonstrate your ability to understand and apply the codes to the particular problem. Uh, you are able to access the codes during the exam it is one of the resource tabs on the computer screen, but you are not able to take a paper or printed copy into the test center with you. So that is why it's really critical, again, as you're preparing for the exam, you're incorporating this codes document into that preparation. So again, whenever you're ready to prepare for the exams, whether that's this fall, sometime in the future, always make sure at that time, you're coming back to our website to access these exam blueprints and practicum resources so you can be preparing with information that directly aligns with the exam. These resources are all, again, free, available for anyone to access on the website at any time. All right, a couple more slides. I still don't see any questions in the chat. Maybe I'm answering all of them, but I'll just throw this out there in case you do have questions. Again, you can utilize that chat box feature. When it comes to scoring the exams, all three sections are scored on a scale from 200 to 800, with 500 being the passing point. 
For the two multiple choice exams, the IDFX and IDPX, you do get a preliminary score report about an hour after you complete your exam. And it looks pretty identical to what you are seeing on the screen right now. This is from a real individual. I have just removed their personal details. And this is nearly identical to what your final and official score report will look like as well. This is as much detail or as much feedback as we are able to provide you on your exam performance. So if for some reason you're not successful in passing the exam, you would want to reference the score report, find the areas that you performed the weakest in, noted by the bubble being further to the left, and then focus your studying efforts on those areas going forward. I should have also mentioned, I'm gonna go back a slide here, uh, another tip for studying that I kind of alluded to earlier, it's really important to utilize these blueprints as you would with this score report because these are their content areas and do an honest self-assessment of where you are in each of the content areas. So if you have um, no knowledge in programming and site analysis and that's just not something that you're dealing with on a frequent basis, then when you are studying, you're going to want to make sure you were emphasizing that versus maybe design communication techniques is something that you feel very knowledgeable in and very confident in. So it's important to utilize those blueprints. Again, figure out exactly where you sort of fit on those knowledge areas so you can make sure to adjust your studying appropriately. Moving on to regulation. When it comes to regulation for interior design, it varies greatly across the U.S. and Canada. Uh, you can see here on this map, there are several different colors indicating all of the different variations when it comes to regulation. In most cases, it is a voluntary step if you're looking to use a particular title like Registered Interior Designer, or RID, or Certified Interior Designer, CID, or Licensed Interior Designer, LID, even when it is voluntary, it is something that we strongly encourage you to do to help elevate and advocate for the profession. In some cases, it might be required for you to practice interior design, period, for you to call yourself an interior designer, uh, maybe to practice a specific type of interior design, like commercial interior design. Or perhaps you might get some additional privileges like the ability to stamp and seal your own drawing. So it's really important as you all move throughout your career and practice in different jurisdictions that you are checking with them to understand what you are and are not able to do. And on that front, if you happen to continue practicing in Pennsylvania for years to come, there have been efforts for years prior to now uh, to get a voluntary registration uh, act passed. Uh, that has not been successful yet, but it does not mean that that might not be instituted in the future. There's been a lot of uh, activity happening when it comes to regulation in the last two years in particular. Uh, Oklahoma, Illinois, Wisconsin have all updated their laws and the state of North Carolina uh, last year instituted a voluntary registration. So uh, just because a state like Pennsylvania does not currently have regulation in place does not mean that something might not be uh, passed or instituted in the future. And having that NCIDQ certification will just help you be able to take that next step in your profession. To tie everything back to the beginning to why certification matters, at its core, it's opportunity. Sort of like I alluded to a minute ago, you have no idea where your career is going to take you, what type of company you might end up working for, what type of clients you might end up working with. Uh, maybe you're thinking of starting your own company or getting involved in higher education or seeking a leadership position. If those entities are not requiring NCIDQ certification, it is going to be strongly encouraged and strongly preferred. So. I encourage you to consider becoming NCIDQ certified earlier on in your career if you're able to do so, just so you aren't limiting the number of opportunities that you might be able to pursue in the future. I also wanted to address the maintenance of the certification. I know that was also one of the questions that was submitted ahead of time is 
how you maintain it. So as it mentions here on the screen, there is an optional $75 yearly fee if you want to maintain active status. Uh, the good thing is that once you pass the exam and become NCIDQ certified, you are NCIDQ certified for life. You will not have to come back and retake the exams, but again, you can pay $75 a year to maintain active status. And along with that, we do have a CEU or continuing education unit requirement. Uh, it gets a little bit complicated, but at the minimum, it's six hours every two years is what you would need to complete. Along that front, it's also really important to know that each entity has their own requirements when it comes to uh, renewal fees, as well as the CEU requirements. So CIDQ has their own requirements, ASID has their own, IIDA has their own. Uh, if you happen to be registered in the, or certified in the state of New Jersey, they have their own, registered in the state of New York, any state that has regulation all have their own. It doesn't mean that you cannot use the same CEUs for multiple entities. Oftentimes you can, um, but some might have specific requirements like you need to have two hours in sustainability or three hours in uh, welfare or something like that. So it's important, again, that you're checking with each of those entities to understand those requirements and those cycles. And you can see there in the chat that uh, Kim posted about the Pennsylvania East chapter holding CEUs uh, in partnership with the sponsor. So that's a great opportunity to not only get those CEUs completed, but also connect with others there in your local design community. Final slide with my contact information. I did see a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, one of them, which was sent to me directly, so I'll answer that one, but encourage any other questions. Now is the opportunity to type them in the chat, and I'll go ahead and just throw my email in there real quick, so in case you think of something afterwards and you forget to jot this down, you'll have access to that. But I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen, and I'm going to answer the one that was sent to me directly, and then I'll invite Julia in to answer, or ask, rather, <laughs> any other questions that are coming through. So one of the questions that was sent to me directly is from an individual who happens to be up in the Boston area and is inquiring about when study groups usually start. So I'm going to answer this for both uh, ASID and IIDA. They really vary from chapter to chapter. Um, some of them are very formal in terms of we're going to meet you know, every Monday night for six weeks from six to eight, and we have a curriculum that we're following. Others are very informal, like we're here as a resource if you need anything, or we have access to resources. Um, typically for the fall exam, they would be starting around now or August at the latest. Uh, again, sort of that two to three month prior to the exam is typically when they start, um, but I encourage you to reach out to uh, your local chapter, if it happens to be the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania East chapter, who mentioned in the chat, for those of you following the chat, they do have some resources available for ASID members that you guys can take advantage of. So definitely encourage you to take advantage of any resources, particularly if they're free, that you can get your hands on. Um, but otherwise, if you happen to be from another location or switch chapters, um, then encourage you to contact them directly to learn about what they have going on. So with that, I'll see if Julia is available and maybe she can toss me the other question and then we'll address any others that she might have or others might want to drop in the chat as well. Thank you. That was really great. Um, there is one question in the chat um, for everyone. Is there a general recommendation for how far apart you should take each exam? Um, could you do one exam each testing period or all three in one testing period combined? Yeah, so this is also a really great question and probably won't like my answer, but it's totally up to you. So we have seen every strategy under the book and there is no right or wrong answer. Um, sort of similar to the studying comments, like you really need to think about what else that you have going on both personally and professionally in the months leading up to the exam. Uh, you certainly could take all three during the same testing period. Lots of people do that. That's okay. Um, however, there's lots of people that just do one test 
per administration or even one test per year because that's all they're able to take on. Uh, some people will choose to do the two multiple choice together just because they're in that similar format, the practicum separately. Some will do the IDFX by itself because it's, again, that fundamentals exam and then the IDPX and practicum together. Um, it's whatever you feel most comfortable with. And that's where, again, it can be an opportunity for you to reach out to some of your fellow ASID members, people in your office, you know, your social media connections to sort of learn what strategies other people use, but there is no right or wrong answer. It's totally up to you once you've been approved how you wish to take the exams. Are there any other questions? I did get another one directly in the chat, so I'll go ahead also address that one out loud in case anyone's in a similar situation to this individual. Uh, this individual has both their education and their work experience from outside of the U.S. They're currently based in New Jersey, uh, and their education and work happen to be in India, and they are wondering if they are still eligible. Yes is the short answer. So if you happen to have an education from outside the U.S. and Canada, uh, the transcript needs to show in English and in U.S. semester or quarter credits. So typically that's not the case. So you would need to go through an evaluation service in order to get that transcript translated and evaluated to match sort of the U.S. standards. And we have links to that on our eligibility page on our website. And their work experience would count just the same as somebody working in New Jersey or Pennsylvania or anywhere else. You would still document it using the same work forms. You would need to have the same uh, sponsor or supervisor sign off on the hours, but it would work just the same as any other work experience uh, in the U.S. or Canada. I had a question. Um, so with the IDFX and the IPX exam, um, you get that preliminary report an hour after. But I believe for the practicum, it takes a few weeks to find out if you pass. That is correct, yeah. So the final and official results for all three exams typically come out about six weeks after the exam administration. So for the April exam, they were released on June the 7th, so about five weeks from the end of April. And for the October exam, it's typically early to mid-December uh, when those are posted. So if you're testing in October, you will not find out your practicum at all until early to mid-December. Uh, and you won't get your final and official, official IDFX and IDPX scores until that date as well. It is very rare for a preliminary score report to change. Um, but it is preliminary, so it is subject to change. So it's important for you to keep that in mind. I would not recommend uh, going out there and you know posting it on, on the internet until that final result has come in, just to make sure that everything is final. I think we have another question. Um, what qualifies you to take the exam if you are in the workplace? Do you need a sponsor? Um, this comes from someone currently working in the independent living community as a designer. Yeah, so all of our work experience hours do require either a sponsor or a direct supervisor to sign off on our hours. And that individual needs to meet one of three criteria, which is being an NCIDQ certificate holder, a licensed, registered, or certified interior designer in the U.S. or Canada, or a licensed or registered architect in the U.S. or Canada. Ideally, that would be your direct supervisor, somebody who's very familiar with what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, if for some reason that individual does not meet our criteria, no worries. You can just find a sponsor to sign off on the hours who does. So maybe that's a former boss, a former coworker, a former teacher, um, a peer, somebody that you know through the chapter um, that's familiar with your work experience. That's always the, the first place to start. Uh, if for some reason you have no connections and you know nobody that meets one of those criteria, you can reach out to us and we can try to connect you with one of our ambassadors to serve as your sponsor. The challenge with that is that that person is essentially a stranger to you. So it is going to require a little bit more effort on your part to articulate and explain to them, you know, what you've been doing in that current employment situation, how long you've worked there. Maybe they'll want to set up like a little interview or video chat with you just to learn more about your background, or they'll 
want to do a reference check or you know see a timesheet to verify that you really were employed there, that would be between you and the sponsor. But uh, that is also very black and white. They need to meet one of those three criteria. It's again posted on the website. It's on the work form itself as well in order for those hours to count. And another tip for those of you who have not yet applied, um, make sure you take a look at the work form before you actually submit it and that it's complete and that the numbers add up. It's very common for people to submit work forms that are incomplete and that just gets your application returned, which just folds everything up in the process. Um, or there's some sort of calculation. So you need to error. So you need to put the number of hours you've worked. So if you've worked somewhere since July the 1st, two weeks, um, but you say you've worked there for 40 weeks and you've worked there for 800 hours, well, you already know 40 weeks have not passed since July the 1st and 800 hours have not happened. So take a minute, check the math, look at all the fields, make sure everything's filled out before you submit it just to prevent any issues during the review process. We still have a couple more minutes in our hour here. Do we have any more questions for Kimberly? I think you covered pretty much everything <laughs> in your presentation. It's very informative. Yeah, definitely a lot of information. Um, again, I type my email in the chat. So if any of you think of anything later on, don't hesitate to reach out. But I really appreciate, again, everyone joining me this evening to learn a little bit more about the exam. Thank you everyone for joining and thank you to Kimberly for walking us through everything. Fabulous. Well, thank you, Julia and Kimberly. Again, if you, uh, Kimberly had put her email in the chat if you have any questions after the fact. Again, this will be up on our chapter YouTube uh, in a few days. You'll get an email when it is ready and available as soon as I edit the video um, and post it. But just as a reminder to thank our chapter sponsors uh, listed here for their support who help us put on programs such as this today. Um, we have our product pop-up tomorrow at 5.15. We have our annual meeting and celebration in September. We have the kickoff to our interior design awards, the largest uh, interior design awards in the Philadelphia region. And we will be doing a scholarship this year for students for the first time. Um, and if you graduate by the time we award it, because it's in May of next year, um, the scholarship will go towards NCI to Q preparation. So that will be the stipulation. Um, but if you're like undergrad, graduate, it'll go towards school. So just a little tidbit for that. That'll, that would definitely help prep you for that. Um, and again, thank you for joining us for NCI to Q fall exam information session with Kimberly and Julia. And we will see you soon. Thanks for joining. Thank you.